Well, let me ask you to go ahead and take your seats. Uh, we'll start in about a minute or so. All right, welcome back. It's, uh, it's great to see, uh, to, to see all of you here. Just a couple of quick things. I mean, St. Paul has declared a snow emergency, so watch the signs on the streets. If you're not a St. Paul native, that's important. Uh, they'll be doing the night plow routes uh, tonight, uh, starting at, at 9 o'clock in the evening, and then tomorrow morning, uh, day plow. Uh, so when you return in the morning, make sure uh, you, you use the parking lots if at all possible. That will uh, ensure that there's no difficulty, but otherwise, uh, for parking tonight, make sure you, uh, you pay attention to the, the, the snowplow uh, directions. But it's warm in here, even though it's snowing outside, and I'm pleased uh, to introduce, give a sort of a brief introduction to the Burgess Lecture, uh, which is uh, kind of part of our, our convocations uh, celebration, and then I'll turn it over to um, Professor Jermo Hansen to introduce our speaker. Uh, as many of you know, uh, the, the Burgess Lecture is jointly sponsored by Luther Seminary and the Global Mission Institute. It was made uh, possible by a fund established back in 1991 in honor of Andrew Burgess, who was a former missionary, missionary executive, and professor of missions at Luther Seminary. Uh, Burgess was active from the 1920s to the 1980s and was uh, instrumental in establishing many of the international relations which are so important for the seminary today. The Burgess Lecture brings uh, leading scholars in global mission to our campus. Uh, their lectures interpret the task of global mission today in light of the Christian tradition, the historical experience of the world of the church, and the contemporary situation in the world. So I'd like to welcome to our podium uh, Professor Germo Hansen, who is uh, a, a, a cherished colleague, and uh, he will introduce our, our speaker for today. So, Professor Hansen. Thank you, Professor Craig. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Guillermo Hansen, and I'm told if you can pronounce correctly Guillermo, you get a one-year tuition free. <laughs> this is how confident we are that you will not be pronouncing it. Anyhow, uh, I am a professor of global Christianity, cultures, and societies. And it is my pleasure and honor to introduce this afternoon the speaker for our two 2016 
Andrew Berger's lecture in Global Mission, the Reverend Dr. Elieshi Mungure. And it is my pleasure and honor in a double sense because a few months ago in uh, Windhoek, Namibia, she was introducing me in a lecture, in a conference that we attended there. So unbeknownst to her, this is payback time. <laughs> You know, what can I tell? Mm -hmm. But seriously, Elieshi, I extend to you a very warm Minnesota welcome, whatever that means. <laughs> and we are very glad that you have accepted this invitation to one of the fora we have here at Luther Seminary, where we learn and discuss about the global church for the sake of ministry in our local churches. So let me tell you a little bit about our guest this evening. Dr. Elieshi Mungure was born and raised in northern Tanzania, where she grew up in a rural congregation in the Lutheran Church. Family and congregation nurture her call, first as a teacher in confirmation classes, and then as a youth leader both at the congregational as well as synodical levels. Soon thereafter, she became very active in the student Christian movement in Tanzania and then elected as a representative of the Eastern and Southern African region of this student Christian movement, an ecumenical movement associated with the World Council of Churches. These experiences led her to Makub to the legendary Makumira Seminary at a time when the Lutheran Church in Tanzania was discussing the ordination of women. This conversation profoundly shaped her theological formation and convictions, instilling in her a passion that is biblically grounded, theologically guided, and pastorally oriented. In 1994, she was ordained to the Ministry of Word and Sacrament, belonging thus to the first generation of ordained women in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Tanzania. After serving four years as a congregational pastor, she was encouraged to further pursue her theological studies, which she did at Wartburg Theological Seminary with an STM degree in pastoral care and counseling. Back in Tanzania for two more years, she could not evade any longer the call to become a theologian and teacher of the church. And guess where did she apply to? From 2002 to 2007, Luther Seminary was blessed with the presence and work of Elieshi in the PhD program in the area of pastoral care and counseling. <coughs> After completing her dissertation, she returned to Tanzania, where she was called as a teacher to her alma mater, Makumira Seminary, and also as the Dean of Students of Makumira University. And finally, in 2011, she is selected as Area Secretary for Africa in the Lutheran World Federation, position that she holds till today. As the Secretary for Africa, she works with the 31 member churches of the Lutheran World Federation in, in Africa, which encompasses roughly 21 million members. This is officially, we can say, a third of all Lutherans in the world, if we look at the numbers as they appear, but actually probably is half of all Lutherans in the world, if we really look at the numbers of active Lutherans around uh, the, our global church. Her responsibilities include the coordination and support of projects and programs initiated by the churches, facing the challenges of poverty, violence, interfaith and intrafaith relations, the caring of persons living with HIV AIDS, women and youth um, empowerment, and of course, theological formation. Elieshi is married to Dioya, 
who is an economist, and they have three children, Irene, Samuel, and Naomi. And I understand that Samuel studies here at Ausberg College. Probably he's here among us. <coughs> Welcome also to you, Samuel. <laughs> So this evening, Dr. Munguri will speak about the global nature of the Reformation and why Africa's contribution matters and how it is shaping the theological conversation around the world as we are preparing to celebrate the 500 years uh, anniversary of the Reformation. So please, especially in this day, join me in a warm welcome to Dr. Elieshi Mungure. Thank you very much. This is a, indeed a big honor and a pleasure for some of us who are fruits of your hands through the vision and the mission of Luther Seminary that uh, you called out us here through the Global Church. You prepared us and you sent us out there to be, to be the feet and the mouth to continue with the mission and vision of Luther Seminary, but also of the Global Church. Thank you very much. Um, it will be unfair as an African if I wouldn't start with the greetings. <laughs> Dear Seminary President, Reverend Dr. Robin Steinke, uh, it's an honor to be here and to be invited for, for this lecture. I bring special greetings from your colleagues, from the uh, Global Communion Office in Geneva, where you serve as uh, in the governance. I bring greetings to professors and uh, colleagues, Luther Seminary community, but to all the participants, sisters and brothers in Christ. Greetings from the General Secretary, from also our new director of the Department for Mission and Development, who also is a Luther Seminary graduate. Reverend Dr. Fidoni Mombek. So this is a blessing, Luther, Luther Seminary, that you continue uh, nurturing and calling more global leaders. It's a credit, and it's an honor, and it's a blessing. I have a few gifts that I'm going to give you, Reverend Robin. Uh, one of it, last year in Africa, we celebrate our 500 years of the Reformation which coincided with the 60th years of Lutheran communion in Africa. So 1995 through 2015, it was 60 years of African Lutheran communion. So for Africans, they say, no, we are not going to wait until 2017. We'll <laughs> celebrate it in 2015. <laughs> and we put, we put just a snapshot of the journey of the Lutheran communion in Africa as part of the global communion. It's called the journey together, LWF communion in Africa, 1955 to 1920. The second one, uh, there are four booklets here that the Lutheran World Federation has prepared for discussions in the congregations, in the classrooms, uh, on the Reformation, liberated by God's grace. So these, these two, they are available online on our website. You can download them and use them as resources. And the third one is my own work from here. It has been published now two years ago. So I'm going to give this to Reverend Robin to be placed in the library. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. 
And finally, you know, greetings in Africa, it goes in, 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 in sections. So you are done with section one, you go to the second one, and you go to the third one. Now, finally, greetings from my family, from my husband, Andy, and from our children, whom some of them, I mean, some is here, but still they have good memories of this community where our lives were shaped for five years. Thank you very much. Uh, as it, I was introduced and in the title of my lecture, it says the global nature of the reformation and why Africa's contribution matters. Africa's contribution to the reformation matters because it is part of the global Christian body in general and the Lutheran family in particular. This short answer, of course, needs explanation. But before going further, it is imperative to give a brief description of the beginnings of Christianity and the Lutheran churches in Africa. Therefore, this presentation is a preview of historical and the social religious contribution of the Reformation and its impact on the Lutheran communion globally and in Africa in particular. It seeks to connect the 16th century Reformation agenda to the African context, its social, political, and spiritual impact on the Lutheranism in Africa. Furthermore, it narrates the journey of the Lutheran communion in Africa while identifying the way forward as it participates, it participates in an ongoing reformation, renewal, and commemoration of the 500 years of the reformation globally, culminating in the Lutheran World Federation 12th Assembly in Namibia in May 2017. In this presentation, therefore, I will discuss the following topics. History of Lutheranism in Africa and its connection with the reformation history, the contribution of the Lutheran communion in Africa to the global communion, past and present, and the envisioned contribution and participation towards the future of the LWF communion. How did Lutheranism come to Africa? Lutherans in Africa are part of the global Lutherans who, are over, who owe their legacy to the Wittenberg's reformer, Martin Luther. Luther wrote and posted the famous 95 Thesis on the door of the castle in Wittenberg, Germany, in 1517 against the Roman Catholic sales of indulgences and other teachings. Luther argued that justification is only obtained as a gift from God. Received by faith, it is a pure grace. According to the book of Acts chapter 8, Christianity sets its foot in Ethiopia and Egypt already in the first century. Later, this faith grew and established in Ethiopia, Eritrea, before moving to northwest Africa in today's Tunisia, Sudan, and others by the second century. This was recognized as the first wave of Christianity followed by the second wave around 15th and 18th centuries, which partly we could be claimed the carrying sparks of reformation and hence partly Lutheranism in nature. However, the main wave, which is considered to be the third and modern one, started around 19th century and reached almost all parts of the continent. This was also the time of partition and colonization of Africa which left the continent with many effects that are noticeable even today. Lutheranism is a result of work done by various mission organizations from Europe, United States of America, and other parts of Africa. As early as 1860, it is reported that United Lutheran Church of America started its work in Liberia. In 1880, German Lutheran mission from Nguyen Kikhen Mission started mission work in Kenya, which later in 1886 has expanded its work to Tanzania, then Tanganyika, through Berlin 1, Berlin 3, that were known as the Evangelical Mission Society for East Africa. The above groups were followed by Swedish Mission and Danish Mission Societies, Leipzig Mission from Sub Saxon Germany, also joined in around 1893, and Bethel Mission from Prussia, 
who became more United Church rather than Lutheran. Lutheran Brethren came to Cameroon and in 1918 to support Paris Mission and later were joined by, by Brethren Church Mission from United States. In Southern Africa, the same wave of missionary activities began around 1846, led by Rhenish Mission and later joined by others from Europe, mainly Germany and Finland. Their main areas of operation were South Africa and Namibia. In later 20th century, Lutheranism continued to expand in other parts of Africa through African initiatives that led to est establishment of Lutheran churches in a number of countries, including Kenya, Mozambique, Uganda, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Malawi, Rwanda, and Burundi. Others, including the, establish of the establishment of Lutheran churches in the Central African Republic, Namibia, and the Angola. Alongside church planting, Lutheran mission societies established the other tools for mission and evangelism, like Radio Voice of the Gospel in Ethiopia, Eritrea, Cameroon, and Tanzania, and several theological institutions to train future leaders for the newly born churches. Social services like schools and health centers accompanied the above mission initiatives to serve the person holistically. In addition, many institutions were established to train local leaders for leadership in various ministries of the church. Analyzing the above movement of the Lutheran mission work in Africa, one could conclude that Lutheranism in Africa is a, is a result of collaborative efforts by missionaries from outside the continent and those from within and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. In supporting the above argument, for example, Bishop Josiah Kibira said, we have become Lutherans by grace. It was not by literal spoon feeding by foreigners, but through the revelation and help of the Holy Spirit and by the study of the local Christians. The mission work needs such collaboration in order to bear lasting fruits and take roots at the grassroots. The African Lutheran churches realized this as early as in 1955 when they held their first ever regional meeting to strengthen their solidarity and lay the foundation for a common vision and mission. Marangu, 1955, a commencement of African Lutheran contribution. It was in Marangu, Tanzania, then Tanganyika in 1955, that all Africa Lutheran Churches Conference, now referred as Lutheran Communion in Africa, met for the first time to recognize the presence of each other as Lutherans, share their concerns, craft a shared vision, encouragement, unity, solidarity, and sustainability and liberation of the continent. The main topics of discussion included Lutheran identity in Africa, theological education and formation for both clergy and lay leaders, mission and diaconia, church sustainability, and other contextual needs of the time. Therefore, for African churches, it was in Marangu that all things began. Marangu gave the joint vision for Africa's future. Participants at Marangu were repeatedly re reminded of the church's role as Maria Lisa Swans gives the content of the paper presented by Bishop Bengt Sundkla at Marangu that, that the church as a prophetic warning and apostolic identification while translating the gospel into generous and rich African terms of expression to the whole life in Africa. This was the Africa Lutheran Reformation. From Marangu then followed the second All Africa Lutheran Churches Conference in Ansira Bay, Madagascar in 1960. In this second conference, participants already urging the missions to take more courageous stand against all kinds of discrimination. It was in this way that they began to combine mission, evangelism, and diaconia. It was also in Madagascar that another tangible contribu contribution emerged 
understanding the gospel as the word of God to bring life in its abundance. Thus, Lutheran churches in Africa took up an interpretation of the gospel message in a holistic manner by saving human beings into his whole heart totality. This concept was later acknowledged as diaconia. The Ethiopia Evangelical Church Mekane Jesus, which is one of the largest Lutheran churches in the global communion, became a leading pioneer on this concept in the early 1970s, particularly under the leadership of, Reverend, of late Reverend Gudina Tumsa, who is remembered, remembered as an African Lutheran martyr that was assassinated during the communist regime in Ethiopia. The Lutheran communion in Africa met again in Addis Ababa in 1965, where they evaluated the decision from the previous meetings and they were motivated on what it means to be a church in a changing African context. Over the next decades, the above legacy continued until today, leading the formation of the Africa Lutheran Church Leadership Consultation that meets every two years to discuss and contribute to the regional and the global communion issues and the themes of common concern. The LCLC established the Lutheran Council in Africa, LUCA, which meets on a yearly basis to make decisions and monitor the decisions of the larger Lutheran communion in Africa. This body, made of the LWF Council members who come from Africa and a few representatives, including women and youth. This is also the body that makes sure that the issues of the region are represented to the global communion and link the global issues to the region. It is with the above spirit of growing and working together as communion that Lutheran churches in Africa continued to fight against the poverty, economic and, economic and other injustices. That has been a great learning and a contribution to the life of the global communion. The LWF 6th Assembly in 1977 in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, another important contribution from Africa. The 6th Assembly of the LWF held in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania in 1977 was a remarkable point in, in life of the Lutheran churches in Africa. This was the first time that Africa hosted the highest decision-making body of the Lutheran communion. This was also the first time that LWF, since 1947, met and made lasting decisions on the soil of Africa. It was at this assembly that participants started making difficult decisions. For example, taking on the issue of human rights, such as working against women oppression, racism and the apartheid, and other oppressive situations that black people in living, living in South Africa and Namibia were encountering during that time. The assembly, for example, adopted the following, one of the following statements. As it said, under normal circumstances, Christians may have different opinion in, in political questions. However, political and social systems may become so perverted and oppressive that it is consistent with the confession to reject them and to work for changes. We especially appeal to our white member churches in South Africa to recognize that the situation in Southern Africa constitutes a status confessionist. This means that on the basis of faith and in order to manifest the unity of the church, churches would publicly and unequivocally reject the existing of apartheid system. Equally important, the LWF 6th Assembly, for the first time, elected the LWF president from Africa and also the first one from the Global South. Bishop Josiah Kibira from the ELCT was elected to lead the communion for the next six years until the Seventh Assembly in Budapest, Hungary in 1894. It was during his time the LWF communion moved closer 
into assessing its meaning of being church in context by making decisions, for example, on status confessionists. Since then, more leaders, both men and women, including youth, have been part and contributing to the leadership of the global communion. The resolutions from the 1977 assembly were taken up again in the following assembly in Budapest, Hungary in 1984, when the elder Blef decided to suspend the membership of the two white churches in South Africa, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in South Africa, KwaZulu, KwaZulu Transvaal, Elk and the Evangelical Lutheran Church in South Africa, Cape Church, for not denouncing publicly the system of apartheid as inhuman and oppressive. This was a painful decision because it was a drift in the body of Christ. These churches were restored back in the communion in 1990 after amending the understanding. This was the, in the following assembly in Curitiba, Brazil. Lutheran Church in Africa also formed committees and commissions for implementing matters decided upon and work for accountability in keeping the unity of the church globally as top pri priority. Influential African Lutheran church leaders, such as Bishop Dr. Josiah Kibira, the then president of LWF, Mrs. Susan Teleoda, the first woman to lead the region as vice president, Dr. Musimbi Kanyoro, the women uh, in church and society director, Dr. Ishmael Noko, the general secretary, Mrs. Pamata Ishaya, the second woman vice president for the region, and the signatory of the joint document on declaration of, ju of justification, commonly known as JDDJ. Bishop Zevania Kameta, Vice President, and Bishop Alex Malasusa, Vice President, just to mention a few, made significant contribution towards the LWF communion at both regional and global levels. In addition, Africa has contributed to the global communion through offering staff serving the communion in various capacities, for instance, in the communion office and in other programs. The above persons have been the think tank in shaping the life and structure of the communion as it is today in connection to the future, sustainability and build bridges for true communion in Christ. This is, in my view, buttresses the argument that the contribution of Africa to the ongoing reformation globally goes beyond continent and that it encompasses all aspects of being human in relationship with God preaching the gospel and saving the neighbor with love. Marks of the reformation of Sola, script, uh, Sola Christus, expressing the centrality of Christ, Sola Scriptura, a continual rediscovering the truth and liberating power of the gospel. Sola Gracia, the people are inspired by theological understanding of grace and Sola Fide, focusing on the strength of power of faith that liberates. In Africa, this marks bear with, with it not only specific identity, but also remind the churches, but also responsibility and accountability as churches continue with, with mission in their context. They remind the churches globally on communicating the gospel with respect and dignity to people of other faiths embracing the creation with all its diversity, commit for ways that brings justice, and at the same time, seeking transparent, transparency and the participation of all. The above factors are very critical, at the same time, as the region seeks to express itself, its identity as Lutheran, in a world that seeks answers to current challenges. The above marks of the Lutheran identity have been embraced in the African local context and enable the growth of the church, both qualitatively and quantitatively. Quantitatively, people are coming to faith in big numbers, 
due to holistic me means of sharing the gospel that churches in Africa are embracing. For example, while there were just a few million Lutherans in Africa in the 1970s, today there are more than 21 million Lutherans, Christians, and 31 member churches in the region. In addition, there are new emerging churches in the continent. Furthermore, many are able to witness the mighty acts of Christ upon their lives as they read the Bible and interpret its message in their own life situations, in time of sorrow and trouble, for comfort, in times of hopelessness for encouragement, in times of struggles for inspiration and assurance. African readings of the Bible point to the practical implementation of the Bible text. They find in the scripture a call to save the neighbor in love. This is one of the most positive contributions of the Reformation movement to Africa. Through printing presses and the translation of the Bible and other important Lutheran documents such as creeds, catechism, and hymns, people are able to understand the gospel message in their own native languages. This encourages the reading of the Bible as early as in childhood, a practice that continues throughout the life cycle. Qualitative, qualitatively, the Lutheran churches in Africa have worked on tangible initiatives that are marked by saving the whole person through diaconia and advocacy programs. For example, through the Lutheran communion in Africa, churches were able to lift up their prophetic voices and actions against the oppressive powers of colonialism, apartheid, and other social and economic injustices. Regional programs like Confronting Poverty and Economic Injustice in Africa has provided the churches with the capacity and language to address social ills and empowers them for positive actions that transforms their lives. The global challenge of incurable diseases such as HIV and AIDS and other and others uh, curable ones such as malaria, typhoid, and of recent Ebola, which is not cured, continue to claim lives of many persons in the continent. Through solidarity in the global communion, churches are able to offer support to those in need in various ways. These include education initiatives and campaigns on the rights to health, preventive measures, provision of medicine and tools for curative measures, developing adaptive skills, especially in the most vulnerable groups. Lutheran churches in Africa are also in the forefront of providing support and relief as well as building capacity for dealing with droughts and other disasters collaboratively and ecumenically. These are just a few measures that are taken by churches in Africa and most of them are geared towards sustainability of the church as they look towards the future with new hope. This now bring, uh, brings us to the second Marangu Conference in 2015. Marangu 2015, the 500 years anniversary of the, Luther, of the Reformation in the Lutheran Communion in Africa. The second conference at Marangu, Tanzania, year after as, uh, is referred as Marangu II, took place from 20 to 24 May 2015 under the theme Marangu to Wittenberg being a reforming church in the changing African context. This marked the 60th anniversary of the first conference in 1955, which established the Lutheran Communion in Africa. At the same time, Marangu II was also mark marked as a Reformation 500 anniversary for Lutheran Communion in Africa. People were wondering, what does the title or the theme of this anniversary really mean, Marangu to Wittenberg. They asked themselves, did we miss the history here? Are we getting it right? Is it not the case that reformation and seeds of Lutheranism began in 16th century in Wittenberg, Germany? And the response was, while acknowledging the history, 
we need to take into account that the churches of the Reformation are churches that are continuously on the move, Ecclesia Semper Reformanda, called, prepared, and sent forth again. Therefore, Marangu II was yet another departure for the Lutheran Reformation movement to continue with God's mission. In its report, the Lutheran World Federation Subcommittee for Reformation has put forward three main principles to guide the LWF process towards the 500 uh, Reformation anniversary in 2017. And these are, number one, Reformation today is a global citizen. It is worldwide. Number two, commitment to ecumenical accountability. And number three, churches of the Reformation are churches in ongoing Reformation. The above principles aim at meeting the following goals. Strengthening the LWF communion among member churches, exploring the meaning of Lutheran identity, and strengthen its ecumenical commitment. This is the task of the LWF Communion until 2017. Both the outcome of Marangu II and the LWF Communion sub Subcommittee for Reformation 500 point out how the whole Communion will continue to work and walk together, experiencing and shaping the global Lutheranism by shaping of the global Reformation experiences. The renewal and the reforming tradition and said above, uh, as said above in Marangu II, has impacted the continent in various ways. Marangu II was another important mo moment when Lutheran churches in Africa commemorated an extraordinary epoch of renewal in the form of the Reformation. It was a time when we remembered the past, related it to some aspects of the present, and deliberately choose those elements that are both exemplary and also considered acceptable boundaries for us as we move to the future more sustainably. And below are some of these examples. Number one is sharing in Missio Day globally. The Global Communion has a good number of Africans working and sharing their gifts and skills in the Communion for renewal and transformation as they serve in various programs or communion leadership. In this way, churches in Africa share their skills in mission and evangelism. In this way, churches in Africa share their skills in mission and evangelism to enhance the renewal and sustainability of the Lutheran communion globally. There are examples of mission, missionaries who have been called from Africa and sent to different members of, member churches in the communion as individuals or groups, particularly for, in the form of exchange. This sort of exchange of personnel brings interrelationship and learning together. That is critical for strengthening and sustainability of the global communion. Africans are also contributing in the planning and implementing global and ecumenical programs and the projects aimed at transforming communities at local and global levels. Number two is sharing in culture and traditions. Again, this has set the ex explanation of the LWF subcommittee for reformation that through reformation began as a, though reformation began as, a, as a sparks in the 16th century Europe. Today it has moved all over the world. This is in the recognition that around 40% of Lutherans are presently living in the global south, and, number, and the number is growing. How does this affect our Lutheran identity or identities? Therefore, Reformation 2017 offers a chance to bring global aspects of the Reformation into our consciousness. And this will be emphasized more in the LWS, LWF as the anniversary will be commemorated in Windhoek, Namibia. Contextually, reformation in Africa were cultural values which gave specific identity and hope. For example, despite cultural diversities, 
most values which gave most most values which gave identity of the African culture are being brought into the communion through sharing of liturgy and worship. We can say that in the liturgy, African cultural identity is affirmed globally. Songs like, listen, God is calling, we are marching in the light of God, or let us, bread, let us break bread together have become global liturgical songs in the Lutheran communion. Number four, self-criticizing on the communion, self-understanding, and its mission in the future. The African Lutheran Communion, 500 years of Reformation anniversary in 2015, has called the communion to be more self-critical by reviewing its theological education and formation works, diaconal ministries, and other ministries where it is confronting systems of injustice and oppression that deny people life in its fullness. How does the current theology taught and done in Africa and elsewhere, especially in the Global South, empowers the prophetic role of the church to speak out against the evils in the societies? These questions bring the church to the core of the Lutheran confession understanding of being church as the assembly of believers among whom the gospel is preached in its purity and the holy sacraments are administered accordingly. The church members need to hear and understand how scripture and its interpretation answers the church questions. Hence, the church needs to empower people for positive actions. And this is where we also ask ourselves critically, how many times as the church have we missed the opportunity by not using the right opportunity at the right time? Sometimes we come too late, and unfortunately, we miss the mark. Fifth, shaping the understanding of the holistic mission. As noted earlier, the Lutheran communion in Africa has contributed significantly to the redefinition of the concept of holistic mission as it encompasses preaching the gospel, saving the neighbor in need, diaconia, and the advocacy, a concept that was initiated in Africa in the 1960s and 70s. This way of understanding mission has since become a pillar for mission and evangelism in the continent. It has also contributed in shaping LWF understanding and the practice of mission. Based on this understanding, the LWF has continued to support a significant number of diaconal projects and programs that aim at bringing change into the people's lives at local context, but also globally, by supporting millions of refugees and other internally displaced people and advocating against the systemic roots, root causes of human suffering. The formation and inauguration of a task force to lead the diaconal advocates' work of the region is a strong commitment and ownership of the African Lutheran churches to holistic mission. Number six is sharing what it means to be in the communion. Africans believe that life belongs and is celebrated in the community. It is the communion where each member feels connected and a sense of belongingness and has a significant role. From Wansira Bay, Madagascar in 1960, the Lutheran Communion in Africa started to raise the issues of women participation in the Lutheran Communion worldwide. One of its resolutions reads, the second All Africa Lutheran Church Conference suggests to the LWF Commission for World Mission and to a participant from Lutheran churches that to delegates to the next All Africa Lutheran Conferences include more women among their members. This recommendation was picked up by the LWF Assembly in 1977 and in Budapest in 1984, where it was resolved to have a quota system of 40 representation of men and women in all activities of LWF. And in 1990, Krutiba, then the participation of youth was added. 
Um, the LWF Assembly, 12th Assembly in the Windwalk, what Africans expect to hear? Or what do we expect to hear from that assembly? The theme of the reformation in the LWF Assembly, 12th Assembly, is as follows. Liberated by God's grace, salvation not for sale, human beings not for sale, and creation not for sale. Despite all efforts by the Lutheran churches in Africa, Africa still faces big three enemies, as were pointed out by Mwalimu Julius Nyerere, the first president of Tanzania, which are ignorance, poverty, and diseases. These enemies have undermined the efforts of the Lutheran churches to fight against injustice. The most leading enemy is poverty, in its broad sense, that cause, for instance, political instability in some countries, despite the fact that almost all African countries have freedom from colonial powers. Political instability causes intertribal wars and different conflicts, which causes deaths. Both ignorance and poverty today in Africa have created interreligious tensions where each religion falls into competition of increasing membership at different costs and fight for the public space where one religion can practice its faith. Negative perceptions of each other's religion that draw on medieval polemics between Christians and Muslims are reinforced by pro provocative preachers who create animosity, poisons relations, and lead, leads to violent conflicts. Different kinds of diseases, such as HIV and AIDS, Ebola, malaria, cholera, diarrhea, are now, then, are now and then emerging in the continent and killing many due to extreme poverty, lack of good leadership and governance, and lack of care of creation brings extreme weather patterns, other and other challenges that the most poor pay the price. The Lutheran Communion expects the Reformation 5 anniversary to address the root causes of these and other challenges, thus agreeing on possible solutions to reduce human suffering and strengthen the communion globally. Below are some proposed ways that Africa could share its part in shaping the global agenda while receiving from the rich contributions from communion-wide relations. Number one is shaping and asserting the contextual Lutheran identity. One of the tasks that we believe the Reformation anniversary in 2017 would do is to explore the meaning of Lutheran identity and the ongoing Reformation, which it is rich in its rich, diverse, diverse contextual reality and how it could enrich life together in the communion. Speaking about God or theology in our diverse context today is an issue at stake. Therefore, the question of hermeneutics and sharing of the word together with respect is important. Member churches in Africa need to bring up theologians and the theological agenda that will shift the global agenda of the communion and also of the secular world by being proactive in seeing and putting forth issues that will make change to the world and the people who seek answers pro probably, uh, probably elsewhere rather than from God. Number two is shaping the intra and interfaith discussions affirming the ec ecumenical accountability. The LWF communion has fostered relationships within its ecumenical family and with people of other faiths in the world. Therefore, there has been a growing intra- and interfaith cooperation in various spheres of mission. For example, in 1999, the LWF signed an agreement of understanding referred to as JDDJ with Roman Catholic Church. This understanding that, are all, that we are all being justified by grace through faith in Jesus Christ has been one of the common ground that bring the two denominations together in a more stronger relationship and understanding. Member churches in Africa have taken up further discussions on such relationship building actions with their ecumenical partners depending on the context. They are also 
These, there are also ongoing dialogues of co or conversations with other ecumenical families, including the Mennonites, the Anglicans, Orthodox, and the Pentecostals. As Africa is more, is the home of, of many Christian denominations and other world religions, such as Islam and African religions. New ways for, to foster relationships with these religious bodies will need to continue to be explored and shared in the communion as the whole world is in need of peaceful coexistence. Today, the churches of the Reformation, all mainline churches in Africa, are challenged by prosperity gospel, neo-Pentecostalism and other new teachings where salvation is becoming a commodity. People are pressed to pay for their spiritual services. Hence, the poor continues to remain poorer and blaming, blamed for their poverty instead of working on coming out of the situation. The richer and bearers of this kind of new message continue to be richer and prosper at the cost of the poor. This kind of challenge resonates with the social and spiritual evils that Luther was confronting in the 16th century, where he had to remind the Roman Catholic Church of the time of that time that salvation was a, a free, is a free gift of God to be received through faith in Jesus Christ. The plight of human suffering and other modern day slavery are more seen in Africa than any other parts of our world today due to poverty and economic hardships that our people live in. The challenges of war and insecurity in many countries in Africa has also caused gender-based violence where women and girls, girl children, are abducted by soldiers and rebels and some are being grossly abused. Today we hear the plight of young people that have gone to school but cannot be get employment or find decent jobs to meet their needs and those of their families. The continent still suffers from brain drain of its prime resources that would bring transformation. Churches need to call for the government for accountability and good governance of all the resources, including right to protection, to protect the people and the resources to benefit them and the future generations. From the perspective of relational theology, God created the universe and entrusted its care to human beings to continue to nurture and maintain its relationship with the Creator. Unfortunately, because of lack of good stewardship, human actions, and natural ch changes of climate, creation is suffering. The effect of climate change, for example, are seen more in developing countries where skills and capacity to adapt or cope are weak. Additionally, there, is, there are issues of your abusing of creation, for example, systems of land use and land tenure that allows few to grab the land while leaving the vulnerable majority miserable, lacking even the basic land to produce their food. All of, the, all of us need to be reminded of the call to the global faith communities and governments to stand up for the rights of the people and the creation as part of our accountability in order to renew and reform our world for the sustainability of the future generations. In concluding, I've tried to bridge the history of the African Christianity to the Reformation movement and its impact to the Lutheran communion in Africa. I've also tried to indicate how Lutheran churches in Africa have responded to the call to be reforming churches in its context and their contributions to shape the identity of the global communion and highlight some future expectations of the Lutheran communion in Africa to the global communion as we journey together to 2017. At the LWF 12 assembly, Africa ex expects to hear the communion addressing contextual issues of Lutheran theology in the midst of diversity context, interfaith, and peaceful existence at the time when Africa experiences war and violence, addressing hunger and extreme poverty and economic injustice that Africa has 
been living into. This will include letting the message from the Holy Bible, coupled with contextual hermeneutical orientation, speak critically to people in their various contexts. Africa also expects to hear resolutions and actions about caring for human beings by addressing the root causes of migration and its effects, environmental care and ecological justice. As we march together towards Namibia in 2017, we trust that by hearing the transforming power of the Word of God together, participants will tread together in the path of forgiveness, reconciliation, renewal of relationships, and commit themselves to accompaniment through transformation of individual lives, hence transformation of the global communion. And thank you for listening. You can, you can hear the appreciation of the group, and thank you so much uh, for being here. There's a, there's a reception that you're all invited to out in the, out in the, the narthex there, and, uh, and Dr. Mungiri, you'll, you'll be available for questions as people want conversation, I assume. Yes. So by all means, uh, don't hesitate to, to linger for, for questions and conversation, and linger out there uh, for, for some refreshments as well. Again, thank you so much for coming.